Now the guest you've all been waiting for. You might know him for his Star Wars novels Cross Current, Riptide, The Old Republic Deceived, or you might know him for his Forgotten Realms novels, both the Erebus Kale trilogy, The Twilight War, and now the beginning of the Cycle of Night or The Sundering. We have author Paul S. Kemp, a native of Michigan, yay for the Midwest, returning to Bombay at Radio to discuss book two of The Sundering, which started in August, with R.A. Salvatore's The Companions, this time it's The Godborn. Welcome back to the show, Paul S. Kemp. So I, I have to say, I approached The Godborn uh, cold. I had not read any of your previous Forgotten Realms books. I knew nothing about it other than it was book two of The Sundering, and I had read book one um, with R.A. Salvatore's one um, right. two months ago. I uh, actually previewed it and so on. And so... I guess the first thing I want I want you to tell us is first tell us a little bit about what your book is about, you know, a short summary, and then how it connects mm-hmm. with the Sundering. Hmm. Well, the Godborn is. Um, let me let me just back up a little bit. So, I have written a lot of novels in the Forgotten Realms, and and all of them feature a character that has come to be my signature character, Erebus Kale, who's kind of a priest shade, uh, assa- former assassin. Um, and th- those books uh, told his story, and that story kind of came to an end at the end of a trilogy called The Twilight War with Shadow Realm. And they, the the whole arc of those stories has to do with a kind of large plot that's going on among the gods and among some very powerful individuals in Faerun. So it involves the the Netherese, which are these um, shadow-infused powerful wizards from the Plane of Shadow. It involves priesthoods of the God of Light and priesthoods of uh, the God of Shadow and some sort of demigods who once were men and have since become demigods. And and all of these sort of various plots and subplots are, are rushing to a head, and the, the, the kind of apex conflict of the story in The Godborn has to do with the machinations of two gods. And the, 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 on the one hand, you have uh, the goddess Shar, who is in Forgotten Realms, kind of the, the god of night and oblivion and nihilism in a way, and regret and forgetfulness. And she is trying to... Um, finished something called the Cycle of Night, which Kale and crew got a little taste of when they visited another world in a previous trilogy, and it, it, it is consistent with Shar's philosophy of nihilism and that it results in the end of that, of that world and all life on it. And I know that sounds a bit sort of almost cliched and, and, and uh, huge in a way, but this is very consistent with, with Shar's theology. And on the other hand, there is uh, the machinations of her... Uh, son, and I'm making air quotes when I say that, her son Mask, who is the god of shadows in Pharaoh, and who seemingly, and in fact did die at the end of the Twilight War, but he died uh, having a secret and having a plot of his own that he had set in motion by way of his agents, uh, Erebus Kale, Dracic Riven, and Erebus Kale's son, Vason. So the god, that's a long, long sort of winded kind of introduction to what happens in the Godborn. So the Godborn is about these various plots um, playing out by way of these mortal and in a couple of cases semi-divine characters. And um, it's told against the backdrop of an event that is um, called the Sundering. And the, the Sundering is it's kind of like a continuum of events almost. It's not one single event. It is it is the process by which two worlds, um, which had come into collision um, about 100 years ago, are being separated once again. And uh, the collision here was kind of um, uh, metaphysical, magical. Some, some parts of one world were trans- transposed onto another and vice versa. So... Uh, all of a sudden, people were thrown into these alien environments. Magic ran amok, and all of Faroon kind of went 
underwent this this radical transformation for a time, and this was all part and parcel of something called the age of upheaval, and that is now um, settling down, and the worlds are are once more separating. So. The story of these characters, Vase and Kale, Erebus Kale's son, Dracic Riven, the kind of um, uh, protege, uh, divine protege of Mask, Mephistopheles, this archdevil, Shars High Priest, Nen, Nightseer, Rivel, and Tanthal, all of these guys are pursuing their ends in a world that is in the process of undergoing the early stages of the sundering, and they're trying to figure out exactly how that fits into what's happening in Shar's cycle of night and Mask's play and all of that. And and underneath all of that, that's kind of like the big umbrella, but underneath all of that, what's really happening are a lot of kind of small-scale character stories. So n- n- no one of those characters has a full picture of exactly what's going on, at the divine level, but all of them have sort of individual character-driven stories that bring them into the net of that divine drama. So, man, that's a lot of words. I don't know if I said that is a lot of words. Did I say a damn thing there? Or was I just sort of rambling? You, you gave you, you, you set it up perfectly. All right, that was that was really good. <laughs> um, and so, if. <laughs> If this is fair to say, I, I, if I have to cut this out, I can. Can we say that the Sundering then is a um, an increased conflict between Loth and like the gods of darkness and shadows and so on, and and the gods and warriors of light, as well as the ending or shifting of the spell plague. Um, it is. I, I think you mean Shar, not Loth. Although Loth has a role in this too, she played. played well, a lot of Loth was in the first book yeah. quite a bit. So it, it, it really has to do um, – the, the second part of that is, is, is entirely accurate. The first part of that is true, but only partially true. So it's the case that the Sundering is about the world's coming apart and the age of upheaval coming to an end. And, un, and part of that is undoing much of what occurred during the Spell Plague, because the Spell Plague in a way was kind of like the apex of the age of upheaval. So now that's in decline, and once the Sundering occurs and the worlds are separated – um, m- much of what occurred as a result of the spell plague will probably be undone. And while it's true that Loth and Shar and some of these other gods and goddesses are trying to figure out exactly what's going on and are jockeying for position, that's true of essentially all the gods. But we're we're just telling the story of some of them. Having read Ari Salvatore's book, and I know the other authors in there, you know, with the elements there and so on. Mm-hmm. I wasn't expecting this to be as dark as your book was. Oh, come on, man. You've read some of my stuff before everything I write that way. <laughs> well, true, but I, I read Star Wars stuff, and then I you know, switched to Forgotten Realms, and I, I just read book one. like, oh, this was you know, kind of like a rebirth, a renewal, yeah. and then I read this. I'm like, oh, crap. Well, from, the very, from the prologue on, this was, for the most part, we can say, kind of like what Batman did with superheroes. It made it more dark, and for the most part, it was a pretty dour book, but... How should I put it without spoiling anything? You you captured a very like dark atmosphere. Now, I guess one question I want to know is, how did you find this? Like, where did you dig this out of? Like, did you have sources? You have like books that you read or influences? Like, where did this dark story come out of? You know, I I actually get asked that a lot, and and uh, I I think I've said this once before. My mom has read some of my books, and she'll ask me that sometimes too, and she's kind of freaked out by the whole thing. I don't, I don't, I don't really know. Um, I, I'm just kind of fascinated by that subject matter, and so I delve into it a lot with with my writing. So all of my, I, I mean, candidly, all of my Forgotten Realms stuff is is pretty dark. But like this book, as you say, it is it is a very dark book. But Vasin Kale, who's Kale's son, is a servant of uh, Amonator. He's a holy servant of Amonator, who's the god of light. So he's, you know, one of the sort of thematic elements in here is is fairly obvious, but it's sort of uh, very small points of light standing firm against really uh, a very big encroaching darkness and kind of uh, hope being the light, as it were. And and Vason very much embodies that throughout the book. And so it's true, it's, it is a dark book, I completely concede, and I try to write that way when I'm writing my realms fiction and the Kale stories. Um, but, but there are elements of, of hope and light in it, I think. But I, you know, I don't know exactly where it comes from. As I say, it's just one of those things that eh, you plumb the depths of your mind too much, you probably get in places you don't want to go. So 
I don't want to dig too deep in. <laughs> I just, I just <laughs> write that stuff down, brother. So I would say, like, at the very beginning, I was captivated by the, uh, the prologue, which I guess this is a minor spoiler, but if you're ever getting the book, which involves a rather different birth scene, um, you know, that yeah. capture that goes from, you know, being something, you know, you have fear in there, you have terror in there, you have hope in there, you have love in there, you have all these different emotions captured in one in one prologue. Did that prologue take a long time to write or rewrite? Because it seemed as if you captured so many different aspects of human emotion in one short little area that it just seemed, I don't know, it seemed too too perfect to be just something that just came out instantly. Well, thank you for saying that. I, I actually, I think that that prologue is probably the, the best opening chapter I've written in any of the dozen or more novels that I've written. So, um, you know, like all of my work, you, you write it and then you rewrite it a bit and then you tweak it and you rewrite it a little bit more. I, I'm not exactly sure how long it, it that, that one that one took relative to other scenes, but, but it, it, you know, it was uh, an emotional gut punch even for me when I was writing it. So, you know, hopefully when that happens, it, it's not because you're just so narcissistic, you love your own writing, and it is instead a bit more of like, wow, this, this does have some emotional resonance. Hopefully it will for readers also. Another early scene um, involved uh, two brothers, which uh, I'm quite sure other people already know who they are, but you know, I had no idea who they were, who at the very beginning I felt sorry for, and then very quickly learned you shouldn't. And then you learn you should. But, you know, these two brothers, like the early scene where they run across a band of uh, peasants that are being attacked by one of the, well, one of the monsters that's inhabited because mm -hmm. of the, the plague and so on. And that scene, you know, I, I should say, it, first of all, it's a very well written scene. Like, you can follow it very well. It tracks very well. But you went, in this whole, in this one chapter, you go from these two brothers that you like to being terrified of them. So did you do that on purpose? Were you trying to make us feel sorry for them, and then all of a sudden you just slip a switch, and you're like, oh, these guys should not be liked? Well, you know, it, it's more like I, I want to make even the most horrible of villains complicated enough that um, even while a reader on the one hand can say, these are evil dudes, and Saeed and Ziad are they're evil guys fundamentally, but but – you, you want to make them complicated. You want to make that evil not not understandable exactly, but you want to make it um, sensible to a reader. And because nobody's just sort of walking around going, "Hey, hey, I'm going to be evil today." So w when you make it sensible, that tends to uh, that tends to um, put in place kinds of details that readers will sometimes go, "You know, I kind of get." Where, what, what has happened to these guys and it's kind of tragic and unfortunate wrong place wrong time um, it, it, and so but by doing that you know you, you can it can seem like you're getting whipsawed a little bit between hey these guys aren't they're somewhat sympathetic to oh, oh my god they're nightmarish and and then finally back to maybe oh oh my god they're suffering a nightmare you know it's it's I, I love creating good characters who uh, people ultimately think are are good but who really tow the moral line and and I love creating evil characters who are uh, at the end of the day evil yes but who still have characteristics that make them understandable sensible if not sympathetic to a reader and I think you know Jeremiah one of the things that fantasy fiction does really well and I've said this many times before is that it really allows for the exploration of kind of of, of morality in a way that that some other kinds of realist fiction does not. And so I try to play around a lot with gray areas of morality with, with my characters, both both the heroes, the anti-heroes, and the villains. I mean, I think, and, I, I mean even Rivelin in, in this, in particular if you've read all of the previous books, to see how Rivelin got to where he is in this book, and, and for people who maybe haven't read all of the books, Rivelin is a, is a high priest of the goddess of loss, who's kind of one of the... Uh, her plotting is, is is sort of one of the big bad things going on in the book, and uh, for him to go from where he was to where he is in this book has just been an absolute blast, right? And he's yeah, I had this feeling that all of these characters pop up that you were just having a lot of fun with them, especially some. I won't spoil what happens in the last thirty percent, but what a character does in the last thirty percent of that book um, that doesn't do anything really until then. I have to say, you must have had a, a, a blast writing the finale of this. I did. I, I, you know, I, I, 
these guys, I mean, the, the, the characters who are recurring characters are, are, you know, I mean, I know them very well, and I really enjoy writing them, and I know their voices, and I know how they would react to things and so on. And, and the, but, but, you know, the new characters, too, really, I, I had a really strong, really strong sort of response to Basin and Orson and their friendship and, and Garrick's travails and the, the very strong difficulties that he goes through. And, and um, so, I mean, I've just got a whole host of guys in here that I can't wait to write about again. And uh, you mentioned Garrick, and when it came to Garrick's storyline, it got to a point in the book when we got to parts of his story that my wife would always come up to me going, what the heck is going on? I was like, oh my goodness, what, what? You? Oh no! I like, I do a lot of commentary on this book, because of, and it's almost always his storyline where terrible things happen. Yeah, and my, my wife would always want to know if I was okay, because you pushed my button so many times. Well, you know, I've actually heard from quite a few people who've read the early copies and the, the, the Garrick bits and the prologue and and some of the things that happened there towards the end are really emotional for a lot of people my wife who's pregnant you know and my wife's very candid when she doesn't like something i've written like some of my, one of my star wars books she's like well that's pretty good you know but that's sort of damned by faint praise when you get that from your wife but you know things some things work for some people though for others but with this book she was pregnant while she was reading it so <laughs> I don't see a pregnant woman like Given you. Given some of the scenes that occur and just her general sort of emotional state, she was, she was, she was weepy all the time while reading this book. So, so that's good. You know, you want, you want, um, as a writer, what you really want is is to set up a kind of emotional resonance through the prose with your readers, and you want them to feel for the characters, and you want them to root for the heroes and root against the villains, and and you want them to feel the highs and lows. So I'm glad that 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 some of those scenes worked for you. So, uh, what were some of your influences for this story itself like where did you draw from from this story like we talked to for example Ari Salvatore and he said you know his book was supposed to be his last Drist book and he wanted to you know he's wrapping up all these emotions that he wanted to put in there so where did you get um where did you draw from for this story in particular and your newer characters that you introduced well um so the, the name of this book is The Godborn, and uh, birth and rebirth are kind of a uh, recurring motif in the novel. If you think of it, it's not always so obvious, but in some cases, in some cases it's plainly obvious, in others it's a little more subtle. But if you ever take a step back and think about it, you'll see that, that birth and rebirth are very, uh, uh, they're very present thematically in the novel. And I, I think, you know, I, I I have sort of young kids, and and one my my one daughter Delaney is two years old, and my our new this daughter Sloane is now five weeks old, and um, as I was, you know, in the case of Sloane, I'd been just been making edits, but with with Delaney, I was writing the the novel with you know this brand new baby, and a lot of this birth and rebirth and the responsibilities that that come with that, and the kinds of sacrifices that people make for for their children, and 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 so on, and and just the the frankly the the terror. That at least I have, you know, I, I always tell people every time I have a, a we have a new child, I have a kind of, you know, this provide and protect response gets triggered in me and I get I, I have these weird nightmares and I have, you know, you're just terrified that you can't keep your child safe or provide appropriately for them and all of that. And I a lot of that fed into this novel. And the, the, the other thing, too, so I had that working on the one hand, sort of that's almost like a kind of a rebirth, new life kind of thing working for me, right? But but tempered by this notion that uh, new life is fragile and it can be hard to protect and, and, and losing it, uh, here I'm talking about some events in the novel, are, are just, they're just impossible to bear. It's just so hard to bear. So uh, there's that on the one hand. And then on the other hand, there is this, um, there is this sense that, that, that I was drawing on or this feeling that I was drawing on is that the, the, this, the story that I had been setting up for, you know, eight books, it needed to come full circle. I mean, I hesitate to use the word closure there, but but it needed to come full circle. I wanted to conclude the story that I had told. I wanted to show how previous events had affected characters like Magadan and the kind of burden that Riven was operating under. Um, and I wanted to do all that while still, and again, we come back to this notion of points of light and, and hope and so on, while still introducing some new characters who... Um, 
haven't gone through all of that and where I've got some older characters who are just weighed down by the burdens that they carry. And Saeed and Ziad, for example, are like sort of uh, paragons of that, right? Um, and, uh, on the other hand, I've got these other characters who who b- bring a sense of hope to that kind of thing. And Basin would embody that, whereas Orson, um, with his his philosophy about being reincarnated and reborn and so forth, he, here's a guy who thinks that he's undergone lots of lifetimes and has carried lots of burdens but still maintains a... a a strong sense of optimism and hope. So all of those things kind of fed into it for me. And uh, I have a child. I'm expecting a child in March, and so I can relate to all those emotions. My wife and I definitely attach to that. Don't let her read the book. I don't plan to. (laughs) She she saw my emotions as I was doing it. I don't think she'd handle it very well. (laughs) So uh, I guess one thing that came to mind, I have all these notes that I made while while reading it. Were you influenced at all in any of your books by... Blizzard's Diablo games? I have never played those. Okay, because there's a lot of, like, the way you use, you know, Mephistopheles and mm-hmm. Hell and so on, or the ways the demons go, it just seems to be... I, I, I haven't seen that very much in Forgotten Realms, but to be fair, I, you know, ones I remember most are, like, the Drist ones, Clerical sure. Quintet, um, Elminster, the Harpers, and, sure. like, Baldur's Gate and so on. So, like, I'm not totally familiar with how all of them work, but, like, I haven't seen this used as much before, and so I was just wondering... Did that come from your research where you, you know, study the, you know, light and dark things, or was it more uh, Wizards of the Coast said, you know, here's an idea that you should start using? No, Wizards of the Coast has never done that uh, with me, which is one of the reasons why I really like uh, writing for Wizards of the Coast. It's been more like, what do you want to write about? Um, let me think about how the Mephistopheles, so, you know, I'm a long time D&D gamer. And Mephistopheles first appears in, now obviously Mephistopheles is, uh, features in, in Christian theology and so on, but Mephistopheles first appears in the sort of D&D guys in the, the old Monster Manual 2 by Gary Gygax. And I, I, I'm not entirely sure why I liked him the most, but th- there's a dynamic there um, w- with him that kind of mirrors the original dynamic that existed between Riven and Kale, whereas Kale was kind of like the top guy he was Mask's number one guy, whereas Riven was number two, and this created a lot of tension between the two of them. They already had lots of reason for tension between the two of them, but this created some additional tension. Mephistopheles is number two to Asmodeus is one. So there's the same kind of dynamic there, too. He's second in hell. He'll always be second in hell. So he's always plotting to become first. And I just really liked that um, as, a, as, a, as something to play with in terms of motivation. And I also liked him kind of as a, you know, he's sort of this, on the one hand, kind of handsome, I wouldn't quite say debonair exactly, but I mean, he, he's a kind of very humanoid-looking uh, devil, archdevil, but, but I, I like the fact that, that, that that's very much a veneer, and I, I occasionally like to pull back the veneer and, and show the kind of truly powerful, horrible being that he is, you know. So um, I, 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 w- because I liked him as a devil and because I wanted to introduce a character way back in the second book of the Erebus Kale trilogy who was the son of a devil with all the complications that come from that, and that's Magadan, uh, I went with Mephistopheles, and, and his role has grown out uh, from there. So, you know, he appears in the Twilight War and, and then obviously in the Godborn. And I really like writing those, those very powerful guys, those those real powerful devils and demons and things. They're they're just a blast to write. So I guess I should ask, um, you know, without spoiling anything, who would you say is more powerful than like these devils that you create or the warriors of shadow? The I guess they're called Shadowvar. Yeah, the Shadowvar are the Netherese who. Yeah, I don't know. You don't need a whole history lesson on the Forgotten Realms. Yeah, they're mentioned in lots of books. They're very powerful wizards, and there's a long history in Faerun for the Netherese, uh, for the Shadowvar. Um, well, I mean, I mean, the 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 short answer is it depends because it depends a lot on on where any kind of conflict is occurring and who could prepare for the conflict and and who has gamed things out ahead of time and and so on and. Um, so, you know, in terms of sort of pure kind of primal power, I mean, it would be very difficult to match Mephistopheles, particularly Mephistopheles with a shard of divine power that he stole from from Mask. Um, you know, that said, archwizards who have been around thousands of years like 
Telemontantel and, and Rivalin, who's now a demigod himself. Th- those guys are very powerful too. So I, I don't, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I really don't, I tend not to think in terms of who's sort of, you get past a certain point with, with characters that are that powerful. And basically, I, a lot of times people who play D&D, they want to kind of put a number on it. And they're like, well, you know, Telamon is a 30th level wizard and, and Mephistopheles is an archdevil. There's no way a 30th level wizard could take on an archdevil. But I don't even really think in those terms because these guys are just so enormously powerful that in any given set of conditions, either one of them could kill the other one. It's just it's just the way it is. So the, my goal is just to tell a really interesting story with really powerful guys. And, and you know, how that happens is how that happens. Okay. Um, and uh, just a, a couple more questions, you know, not necessarily related to that one. So you mentioned before how, you know, being a father really, you know, related to, to some of the stuff in this. So is, is that why there's repeated themes throughout this whole thing about especially fathers mm-hmm. and losing, you know, fathers and the effect of losing wives and children or the, uh, or the potential of losing wives and children and so on? Was that, like, really, really on your mind when you wrote this? Because it's repeated over and over and over. It, it, I agree. It is. It shows up, um, it shows up a lot. I, you know, it probably is on my mind and was on my mind, uh, and I pro- but it is pro- probably also pretty deeply embedded in my subconscious, too. And, and like, if I reread the book, and I, I make a habit of never rereading things that I've written before, but if I were to reread the book, I bet I would see a lot more than I consciously kind of put in. So, yeah, it was on my mind, and some of those instances are obviously uh, intentional. But I, I bet there's some, some of the subtext and some of the, in some of the scenes and with some of the relationships of the characters it was probably something that happened subconsciously. Because it is. It's, just, it's on my mind. I, you know, I have young kids, so it's just something I think about a lot. Okay, so now this next question is more about what Wizards of the Coast was doing. Um, you know, this the series, The Sundering, is you know a D and D event. It's their Forgotten Realms event. You know, it's a big event that's changing as they change rules for D and D and so on. Mm-hmm. So, uh, how did Wizards of the Coast approach you to write this book for The Sundering, or did they say see a book that you were writing and say put it as this as The Sundering? Because The Sundering seems to be you know it's what eight um, uh, related but unrelated contain stories. So how did they put that together? So it kind of went like this. Um, I was an am. I was under contract to write um, the next trilogy featuring uh, the ongoing stories of Riven and the Shadow Bar and all that. And this was going to be called The Cycle of Night. And for a variety of reasons, there were some delays associated with this. And I had the story outlined and, and eventually had begun to write it. And while I was in the course of writing this, my editor kept saying, do you think you could tell this story in, in one book? And I'm thinking, uh, candidly at the time, because this was a, he was a new, he was new to me at the time. This editor and I hadn't worked together before. I was thinking, what in the hell are you talking about? Of course I can't tell it in a story. It's a, it's a trilogy, man. <laughs> you know, uh, but he wasn't giving me any further detail because at the time he wasn't able to. So he was just sort of sticking out this sort of general probe of a question. So I just went on my merry way thinking that was just a puzzling question. Well, then at some point I got an email from, from James Wyatt, and he said, look, we're, we are, we're doing this storyline. We're planning in this storyline called The Sundering, and uh, we want six, six novelists, and um, we, we want to tell the story of The Sundering, and Bob and Ed are on board, and we want you on board. Are, is this something that you're interested in? And I said, I, I am, but I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the process of writing a cycle of night. How's that going to work? How are we going to release that and all that? And at the time, James just said, let's just put that to the side for now. Hit the Sundering Summit's coming up. Let's, we're going to get together all the authors. We're going to talk through how we're going to handle this, and we're going to develop the storyline and so on. So fast forward a couple months to the Sundering Story Summit that I had to attend by phone, but all the other five authors were out in Seattle. And, you know, with with Wizards uh, R&D and some of the D&D brand folks, um, we were kicking around various and sundry story ideas. And this, I think, was the first time that I got a genuine sense of what the sundering was going to be. And after that first meeting, I realized that the story that I was telling in the cycle of night, or the story that I wanted to tell in the cycle of night, was a perfect fit for what they were trying to do with the sundering, with a couple of small sort of background tweaks, but nothing substantial in terms of, of storytelling or plot. So I made my pitch and said, listen, let's think about this. Here's here's what I was going to do with the cycle of night. Why don't I 
just do that with a story that um, is going to be part of the Sundering. And, you know, once I outlined that, they, everybody was on board with that. So that's really how that all came about. Okay. And then uh, I recall you sharing on your Facebook page a story um, uh, between you and your, uh, your not editor, maybe it was your editor, about how, uh, you know, you thought you wanted this book to come out on a New York Times bestsellers list and your editor or manager didn't agree how it's going to oh, be there. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, you know... Um, I've been on the New York Times bestseller list, I think, four times, and um, I I, th I think still that that this book could, I I don't I feel sort of almost dirty talking business here. So apologies, readers. I'm not this isn't all about sales at all of that, but I kind of have a bet going with my editor. So I sent him and I said I sent him an email and said, listen, uh, I know what the laydown is on the book. I know what the book buyers bought. So that's enough to hit the the Times list if we move enough copies that first week. Um, so I, th I think we're going to do it, man. And he sent me back a mail and said, listen, we're going to do well, but the competition's really stiff that week. I don't think we're going to do it. And I said, the hell you say. And we made a bet. So we bet uh, a bottle of scotch that it will hit at least the extended list when it when it comes out. So for that, it's going to need to move, you know, people hopefully will be interested enough in it to, to buy it. And if it moves enough copies, it'll hit. And if it doesn't, then it doesn't. Then I own a bottle of scotch. But by God, we took a run at it. And it comes out on the 31st, right? October 1st. October 1st. It comes out on a Tuesday, so that's just the and way it is. This will be out on October Sunday, 1st. so hopefully we can move some people that direction. Oh, good. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I, I think, you, you know, the, the people have been waiting for the the next sort of Riven Shadow of our Kale story for a long time. So I, I think there's there's some demand there, and, and uh, reviews of the book have really been very kind. So I, I think that... Um, and that's great because I really want to tell a story that people have a blast with. And, uh, you know, well, this what happens happens. I mean, that, that kind of stuff's essentially out of my control at this point. Well, this episode will be out on Sunday with my review of it, so I'll double book it so that we can get as many people there as possible. And don't worry, my review is pretty much glowing because I was, I was, I was definitely blown away and surprised that this book was as good as it was. Well, I really appreciate that, Jeremiah. Thanks. It was better than Ari Salvatore's. That's easily put. <laughs> well, you know, Bob and I tell very different kinds of stories. So I, th I think I think we, we there's a fair amount of crossover. Bob sells way more books than I do, but there's a fair amount of crossover in terms of you know if you like Bob, I think you'll like my stories too. But we do have a very different tone. You know, Bob, Bob tells stories that I think are are very much in the vein of class heroic fantasy, which is awesome, and and mine are a little bit more in the uh, anti-hero, sword and sorcery, gritty kind of vibe. So uh, you, they definitely have a different kind of tone, but but hopefully both work well for lots of readers. Okay, so uh, I guess to uh, wrap this up, uh, why don't you tell listeners uh, what else you're working on, when they can expect more books after this one, or anything you'd like to tell them. You know, you could have a book signing, as far as I know. When, when would you uh, – anything you want to tell the listeners? <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, I do have a lot of things in the hopper. Um, but I've got two more Forgotten Realms novels that will be – at least two that will be following up to the God – the Godborn is a standalone, though. There's no, there's no cliffhanger or anything. But there are novels that build off of the events of the Godborn that are coming after. I'm working on those. I'm working on the next uh, Egil and Nick story which um, hopefully will come out sometime next year. And um, I don't, I, you know, because of my family and day job, I don't do a lot of book signings or conventions or anything, so I don't have anything like that going on. But if anybody ever wants autographed books, I have instructions for that on my website at paulfkemp.com. It's easy. Just let me know what you want signed, and I buy it. You PayPal me. I ship it to you. Sign it. That's that. So that's, awesome. that's what's going on. Okay, and the book comes out on October 1st, basically everywhere. <laughs> basically everywhere. Ebook and uh, bookstores, Nooks, Kindles, doesn't matter, you can get it. You can get it, and I hope that you will.